the people of sake actually brought me into sake. Back in 1988, this place was actually in Ginza on the main drag. At first it was kind of soy sauce, it was miso. To the point where it actually changed my life. New Year's Day 1989. Uh, not just sake as a beverage, but all the culture and history. And Hello, welcome to another episode of Sake on Air, broadcast with the sport of the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association. From here at the Japan Saki and Shochu Information Center in the heart of Tokyo. Uh, my name is Chris Hughes, and joining me here today, we have on my left Christopher Pellegrini, uh, resident Shochu and Awamori nerd. Thank you for having me. Nice to have you here. And then on the right hand side of Chris, we have. Hi guys, this is Marie Nagata. We're back again for an episode on Terror today. Yes. Wonderful. And then on、uh, Marie's、uh, left hand side. Hi, my name is Eli Nigren.、Uh, currently work for Chiyo no Kame Shuzo in Ihime Prefecture. And then,、uh, yeah, sake fan and brewer. Wonderful. So, yeah, we have a, we're very、uh, honored and privileged to have a guest host with us today to help us、uh, debate today's topic. So, yeah, we're very, very, very pleased to have you, Eli. Very honored to be here. Thank Thanks you for having、much. me. Thanks for making the time. Come on. And then, of course, on the left hand side of Eli, we have. Hello, everyone. This is <laughs> Sebastian Lemoine, and today, particularly happy because we're going to discuss a word from my language. <laughs> <laughs> What are we going to discuss today, Sebastian? You're going to laugh at all of us mangled <laughs>、so、pronunciation、I'm, on the word. I'm going to have to teach you first how、okay. to pronounce it. <laughs> okay. The word is terroir. 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 So, we are going to be rather daringly, I might add, digging into the topic of terroir.、Um, we will actually start today by kind of decoding it, and then we'll dive into a discussion or rather a debate on whether or not there is a terroir in the sake world, and whether or not we should have a terroir, and is there a point in having it, and why do we have a terroir? And then, you know, when we're really just going to be laying out the groundwork in this episode. For future episodes, because this is a topic that you can't possibly cover in one 50 minute, one hour session. And the thing about、uh, the Saki t e w a r is we've only just started debating it in the Saki world. We've only just started talking about it. So, yeah, this is the episode that kind of launches our foray into the topic of t e w a r So, without further ado, I would like to ask Sebastian. To explain、uh, from a French perspective, you know,、um, what does it mean?、Um, I believe that terroir as a word only exists in, in, in French, even in Spanish or Italian. There is no equivalent, although both countries are quite close in their, in terms of their culture for winemaking and, and gastronomy.、Um, something which is really specific of, of terroir is that it comes from the word terre, so which is earth, but it's much more than just a soil or a place. It's basically an alliance. It's, it's an alliance between man and A natural environment is the way man has cultivated the environment that makes terroir. And、uh, that environment is a place, a soil, a climate, and other natural elements. Wonderful. Beautifully put. And, and actually, we have the word terrain in English. So I was wondering, are they maybe similar? Does, it, does terrain come from terroir? Maybe some of our linguists listening could, could maybe write in <laughs>、yeah. and let us know.、Uh, Well, terrain is definitely referring to the topography of a, of a、yeah. place.、Yeah. I think it's more topographical than it is terroir, which you were saying、mm-hmm. is, is everything around. It's the climate, it's the, it's the soil, it's the water basin, it's the water table. But you also said something very interesting before. You were referring to taste as well.、Mm. We, can, we can look at it from、uh, the terroir of that produce is this place. But what Really is more interesting for, for the consumer or helps selling that terroir is,、uh, the, the taste that is associated with it. And,、uh, we're always shifting between the two,、uh, the two concepts and something makes it, sometimes makes it a little bit confusing to distinguish between the two conversations. That's right. And actually, John、uh, Gordon wrote a very good article all the way back in 2014 on this、mm-hmm. topic. And I think he described the terroir perfectly, actually. And he says, That it is local human and natural factors that give a product unique characteristics that make that product's origin identifiable, basically tying that product to a place. 
And I have another um, very, very much shorter definition I found on the internet, which seems to appear quite a lot, which is a taste of place. And it's definitely, even in winemaking, terroir is not just about the soil, right? It's about the climate, the local surroundings, cuisine, people, culture, history. Have I missed any? So I think well, a, it's a lot and, more. I mean, the way the soil has been cultivated as well, right. because you don't grow, if we talk about wine, uh, grape the, 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 the same way, depending mm. on what the soil looks like, the soil composition is. Mm. And it's not just a, it's not, terroir is not just a, a wine concept, um, although it originated in wine. You've now got, Beef to us, cheese to us, coffee mm. to us, mm. beer to us, obviously. Olive oil. Olive oil to us oh, as well. I actually found an example of an olive oil to us, which I think was really interesting. Um, so I'll just uh, read out. An olive grove where peach trees actually share the to with the olive trees produces olive oil, um, which takes on fruity characteristics. That's really That's interesting. Crazy, huh? Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, and of course, you know, in the case of a coffee tour, it's all about like the roasting altitude and uh, the kind of the temperature and things like that. So yeah, there's a lot of different sure. factors that go into the tour. But anyway, the question that we want to debate in today's uh, episode is where should we be looking for the sake tour? Who wants to kind of start me off? Right? Where, where do we start with this? Where, where do we start? It's well, just it's, such it's a good. big topic to really mm. tackle on. And um you mentioned a taste of a place, mm. right? Mm. And that there is certain traceability to um, character characteristics of a certain terror. But also, to what extent do we expect there to be traceability of a certain regional characteristic? And, you know, I do miss having John here today with us mm. because one of the things that um, really stuck in my mind when I took his um, certified second professional course, there's nothing that's 100% certain insofar as sake flavor profiles go. Like you can have a ginjo that doesn't quite taste like your perception of ginjo or a usual standard of what we, we would expect a ginjo to be like. Or you can say the same thing about Yamada Nishiki sake or Yamahai sake. So um, with all of those ambiguities that we, we play with in, in the sake world, exactly to what extent do we expect there to be a certain defining characteristic? You're completely right. If there is a tewar in sake, even if it did exist, it's going to be very, very diluted just because of the fact that the sake, the flavor is very subtle, you know? Right. Very yeah, ambiguous is the right word, I think. Um, and, and the whole concept of tewar is kind of ambiguous in the first place, isn't it? Because like you say, they don't define the extent to which you should be able to you know, pick up these characteristics or trace the, the origin. If I could just add, I would say that when you're talking about this topic in, in relation to sake, uh, I like to try to keep it simple and to, to say, to back up and say, okay, how can we, since there is no clear definition, we can start by looking at simply the ingredients of the yeah. beverage, right? And so one of the, the first key ingredients, obviously, is rice. That's what I had down in my plans. So let's go ahead with that, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, let's talk about the rice. So if, if you were going to talk about wine, you talk about the grapes, right? So uh, that's the equivalent in sake, if you like. So one key difference between, I think, the grapes and the rice is the fact that unlike grapes, you can transport rice over large distances and, you know, you, you can basically take your rice anywhere, can't you? And traditionally, that's what, that's what's always kind of happened. And so the argument is, even if you say there is such a thing as a tuwa based on the rice, you could have a brewer seven prefectures away who is able to get that same rice. And then technically, couldn't he produce the same characteristics in his or her sake. So, yes, if you only look at the rice type, varietal written on the label, mm. uh, you cannot draw a conclusion from that. Mm. Um, that being said, uh, I'm still convinced that a, a rice, uh, a particular rice, but not, I don't mean the name of the varietal, but the, the rice that is actually used for a production is a very important element mm. of the um, style and the taste of the mm -hmm. uh, of the sake, so part of the terroir definitely. One of the conditions, or one of the rules you often see when people are talking about terroir is those site specificity. It's massive. Like you hear about wineries that you know uh, the same wine being made in, basically with grapes from five different vineyards or five different plots of the same vineyard, only like five meters apart, having completely different characteristics. And then saying that you can only produce those characteristics with this particular site. Could you do that with sake? Because like the, being able to transport them over large distances. I mean, I'm not able to answer that, that question. <laughs> well, and I think 
to that point where you mentioned, you know, some um, plots of a of a vineyard mm. next to each other could produce very different and results of mm. grapes. Um, I think there's more to it than just um, how like geographically um, apart they are, because it, you have to take into consideration how old the the vines are and what kind of damages, if any, have been to the to the vines and True. what are the you know sunshine versus you know rain um because different patches of land get different sunshine so it's difficult to compare to rice because rice Mm. is a plant that grows and dies within a year so and um, you generally can't grow it on the side of a hill right yeah yeah that's right sorry i'm sorry i think it's actually it's actually impossible to grow some varieties of grapes in some parts of the world right? right because of the climate or whatever you don't i mean Yamana Nishiki is a difficult one because that's actually, it isn't possible to grow that all over Japan. Most of the other rice varieties that I know will pretty much grow anywhere in Japan. So there, it's very difficult to kind of, you know, say, well, we use this particular rice type because it only grows here. And that's a big part of the 2R. Making the wine the way you make it or making the product the way you make it because the ingredients are only sourceable in that particular area. And that's what you kind of, that's what naturally, that's what you have to work with. Right. Also, if we look at it from a historical point of view, uh, perspective, I think it's very different in the way that um, rice is used to make sake and the way that grapes are used to make wine. The, when, it, when sake brewing first started, I think basically it was just rice that was left over, right? And they, they, they wanted to find a use for that. So they started making sake or whatever. And if you kind of go further ahead in, in the, the history, then it's mainly people just sourcing, being given the rice from a cooperative or whatever. If you go all the way back, so the origins of sake, the kind of the beginning of sake brewing, there's very little emphasis on actually trying to on purchasing a particular type of rice because it has particular characteristics. What I what I want to say is, scientists are actually contributing to the story of uh, of, of terroir for sake. Um, we were together at the uh, Akita uh, Sake Annual Sake Party in, in Tokyo uh, a few months ago, and we tasted this. Um, Two sake is made from new rice types, and clearly, um, Japanese scientists are the kings of crossbreeding yeah. in yeah. terms of rice. And yeah. most of the sake rice that are being used today are fairly recent; mm. um, they've been developed in the last seventy years or so. Mm. And uh, you could clearly see that these two rice types developed by the Akita um, Research Bureau or whatever they're called mm. were meant to be grown in Akita and yeah. best express a, an Akita style. So mm. uh, they're actually contributing to the, to the, to the, to the yeah, story. Yeah, that's amazing. I think that's definitely true. Um, we can't say 100% though, because no. we, because we haven't tried to grow them anywhere else, right? So we can't say 100% that that's the case, but there's definitely something there. And especially the rice varieties had characteristics which suited the style of sake that they were making in Akita as well. That's probably key. What, another thing I wanted to say is, if there is a, uh, I mean, a key element when I think of of wine is uh, we talk about a, a region, we talk about a grape, mm. grape type, grape by at all, and not much else. Mm. But that's not at all how we define a sake in Japan, especially over the last. I don't know, since the war, I would say, we define a sake about how it's made, its production process. We don't talk about ingredients so much. There you go. We talk about polishing rate. We talk about um, the yeast starter type. We talk about has it been filtered? Has it been pasteurized? Has mm-hmm. it been diluted? That's what's come first as information. Mm-hmm. That's the focus more than the ingredient, I mm-hmm. think. And so the, the conversation comes up today because I think the word of sake um, needs terroir mm. um, to go to uh, another st- another stage. But until recently, maybe the, 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 the terroir as a word was not necessary in the sake world. Definitely. Absolutely. And you know what, though, I found really interesting uh, during my research is that there are actually people in the wine world debating whether the terroir actually exists. Mm. You believe that? And they're saying basically a lot of people are saying that, well, Yes, there are a lot of convenient coincidences in there, right? Mm. Which may be true of a tour. But actually, in most cases, in a lot of cases, I'll say, the house style actually overrules the tour. Now, however strong it is, right? And, and that's definitely the case in sake. I think one of the reasons that this, uh, this concept is being, I think, start, starting to be 
become discussed more frequently and starting we're starting to see it in, on sake labels is because the market itself is starting to get more competitive and everyone is trying to find a way to uh, set themselves apart, right? right? And that's both for the d- domestic sake brewing market and for the overseas market, I would say it's true for both. Um, and so one of the ways that people are doing it, you know, we were just talking about traditionally up until this point, most of the focus has been on, you know, the uh, polishing rate or, um, you know, other factors. Uh, but one of the ways that people are starting to do that now is by highlighting these other factors, right? And that I think, you know, we're talking, we're obviously, we all understand how difficult it is to define this concept. But um, one of the ways that that is, can be talked about is through, say, rice variety, for example. And so um, certainly, you know, I've, I've seen a number of breweries that will, you're talking about the, the rice in Akita, you know, highlighting a rice uh, variety that is, say, specific to that area and has not been grown anywhere else or is currently not grown er- anywhere else. That's not to say that it couldn't be in the future. Um, so that's certainly one one way that, that people are highlighting it. And I think they're doing that to, um, again, it's, it's sort of a, a marketing uh, technique Definitely. and a way to set themselves apart from the co- competition. Um, I recently visited um, Matsunot's Kasa uh, down in uh, Shiga Prefecture, and um, I definitely saw a def- I know evidence of a, a towa there. I mean, you know, they are openly um, exploiting the, the concept, and um, they basically so they grow their rice in different plots of land, and each plot of land has a different soil. Um, you know, composition, oh, wow. and it's based entirely on the French red wine uh, system that you see in like uh, Pomerol, I think, isn't it? On the east side of the, um, I get the name of the river wrong. It's the Gironde, isn't it? Gironde. right? The Gironde. Gironde. And um, so I tasted this sake uh, from each different plot of land. Very, very different. Now mm-hmm. I'm not sure I could pick out the exact characteristics, but very different. And when he explained, kind of, uh, when the uh, Shacho explained, you know, what was what well, basically how he was using these different soil compositions to create these different styles of sake. It made complete sense. Give you an example, uh, and exactly the same as Pomerol, the way they make the red wine there. So one of the soil consumptions contains a lot of clay, which has less drainage, mm-hmm. right? So you get less water drainage, you get less mineral nutrient drainage, and so the end sake ended up being much more kind of ri- uh, you know like rich, if you like. Um, and then you had the opposite, the kind of sand or loam or whatever, and then you ended up with a much kind of lighter, drier style. Now that's a, you know, that's a very, very, still a very vague description of a sake. You know, you need to look closer at the, the individual characteristics. But for me, that having recently done a lot of wine study, I saw definite evidence there of a tawa. But it is a wine inspired tiwa. So whether it's the right one for sake, I don't know. And before we talk about water, actually, I wanted to go to Chris, sir. I forgot to do this. I wanted to go to Chris. And have a look at the shochu um, in the shochu world. You have you use lots of different ingredients to make shochu. So yeah, that's definitely true. And so there's a different story based on whichever uh, base ingredient you're talking about. I mean, you could be talking about uh, water chestnut shochu, or you mm-hmm. could be talking about aloe shochu. Um, the biggest seller in Japan is sweet potato shochu, and there's one GI uh, ascribed to that uh, to sweet potato shochu made in Kagoshima. It's called satsuma shochu. All the Sweet potatoes have to be local. Um, the water, the koji has to be, be made locally. So it's more of a regional protection thing, which is very common uh, for AOCs as well, for GIs, right? So in my understanding, it's there's two aspects to this. There's a, ge- there's a geographical protection mm-hmm. element, and then there's also the marketing element that we talked about before. And different places are trying to create their own terroir story. Um, when I worked in the beer industry in the States, you know, it, our own, our uniqueness was in our water and we protected that. We tested it every morning and we, we, we panicked when something felt a little bit off and we would have to approach the water with different techniques for getting it back to where we wanted it, different osmosis and, and different treatment techniques that are quite costly and time consuming. But, you know, sometimes we had to pour out beer. You had to kill beer, you know, pour it straight down the dra- drain because it was that important. It was that too, important. Wow. Too highlight. Oh, uh, absolutely. You yeah. cannot let your customers down by, right. you know, that's their hard earned cash and you're just going to be, well, this one's not how we normally make it. You can't put that in the bottle. Yeah. So there was, there was that element there. So I, I kind of come from this protecting your brand, protecting your region w- with whatever you can. And, uh, the shochu industry has many of these conversations going on 
and sweet potato is probably the best established. But then again, in, in Kagoshima, it's just sweet potatoes grown in Kagoshima. There's like five dozen varietals being used right now from the super, super white as this paper to the garnet, most purple thing you've ever seen in your life. They create completely different drinks. And, uh, that's not even taking koji into consideration, but for me, and if I, maybe I'm, I'm jumping into another, uh, rabbit hole here. But for me, the biggest thing always since my days in the beer world has always been yeast. Uh, okay. And that's, that's yeah. for me, that's huge. Cause yeast, you can take, you can take the same starch source and, you know, brew it separately with two different types of yeast and you get two different, two completely different yeah. drinks. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, it's I think, a perfect, gigantic uh, kind of, segue to talk about yeast and how that relates to terroir and sake sure. because yeah um i don't well, i don't want to jump over water jump. okay i don't want right, to jump over right. water because, whoa, whoa, hold on. because guys sake is 80 percent water is it oh, you're it sure is okay. so, well, at least so on that fact based on that fact alone surely the real terroir is in the water i i think well as we know with all alcohol wherever there's good water you're gonna have yeah. people making alcohol basically yeah. Um, and I think there are several, um, very, very good examples from the UK, for instance, of, of yeah. the water minerality directly affecting the beer. Mm-hmm. And they're very, very protective of that. Wherever you find good water, you find <laughs> a really good brewer, right? You find good breweries, you, sake breweries, you find good quality sake. So on that note, where do we go with the water? I mean, I've, looking at the water, clearly the first thing you look at is the minerality, right? So your different water sources, mainly, coming from kind of um, subterranean water sources, either kind of, you know, quite shallow levels, quite deep levels, um, being pumped up through wells. That's the traditional way of actually kind of sourcing the water for sake. Um, And of course, this water originates in the nearby mountain, right? Which originates as rainfall. You've got all this minerality in there, and we know that the minerality in the water drives the fermentation, right? You get different kind of speeds of fermentation. You get different kind of um, styles of sake from the actual minerality in the water. And probably apart from that, you also get characteristics from the water. Well, can we, if you look at, for example, um, uh, I went to a brewery in um, Hyogo Prefecture, which is right on the coast, right on a bay. And they have a really clear salinity right. in their sake. And I said to him, I said, this reminds me of the sea. He said, yeah, sometimes because of recent earthquakes, the ground kind of, you know, creates little cracks and some of the, the sea minerals get into the, not into the water itself, but into kind of like the, the soil or the channel or whatever. Mm. And somehow it gets into the water. And we've tried everything to get rid of this salinity. We just can't. It's there, whether we like it or not. I know of a lot of breweries that pride themselves on, uh, talking up the point that they source you know Mm. water that is very close to their brewery Mm. um and they may not use the specific word terroir or Mm. anything like that but they they certainly um like to focus on that point um and i think that's another uh differentiation factor you know they so um yeah yeah, i would just add that right you know the importance that water plays, locally sourced water plays into how an end result of sake comes out is just huge. huge. Like it's a it's a very big significance um, what water plays in sake terroir. Um, a good example I can think of right now is um, um, Asamai Shuzo from mm-hmm. Akita, where they only use rice and water sourced from within five kilometers of the brewery. Right. And... Um, I think they take on, I guess, what we would call like a domain style, I mm. think, in the wine world where the rice is grown kind of almost on site. Um, and then the water is sourced from within the brewery. And I could only speak for myself, but there's like a very good, there's a clear consistency of, I guess you would say, the minerality and then the texture and then the overall sort of flavor profile of the sake, which um, I believe without much scientific evidence to bring to the table at the moment now is a good example, is a good showcase of what terroir is is mm. able to achieve. Uh, for some of our listeners that don't know, in, in Japan there is um, there are two types of water basically. There's kind of like a female water, which we call onnamizu, and then there's male water, which is otoko mizu. And w- let's look at otoko mizu first because one type of otoko mizu is very, very famous. You may have heard of uh, miyamizu, 
mm. which um, originates in Hyogo Prefecture. And it is basically the thing which undoubtedly gives Hyogo Prefecture its very kind of hardened, rich style. And Miyomizu is actually uh, found by a brewer who was brewing in two different plots of land. Okay, And he was doing everything the same to make his sake. He was a toji. Make every, he said, I've got the same people, same techniques, same rice. Same volume. Same volume. What's going on here? Why am I getting a different quality of sake? Much better quality of sake at this different plot of land. And then after you know trial and error, it hit him. It was the water. And the water that he was using in, in one of the places was actually traveling along what used to be the seabed. And it was picking up minerality from the seabed. Oh, wow. And that was imparting characteristics in sake. And Miyamizu is very famous. I mean, that's what pretty much defines Shogo Prefecture. Sake. And then you have the opposite, which is Fushimizu, right? From uh, which come the underground water channels in Kyoto, in Fushimi. And it's the opposite, isn't it? It's very kind of soft, very simple, very kind of light styles of, of sake. Very soft, isn't it? Compared well, it's to not the, the softest one. No, it's Hirosh- not the softest Hiroshima one. Hiroshima is being yeah. a story mm. uh, yeah. about Shizuoka, around, maybe, and or... around soft water. Yeah. And Saiju in particular. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you've got historically the water definitely plays a big part in sake brewing. Do we have any arguments for maybe why water wouldn't be the sake tewa? What's the problem with establishing water as the sake tewa? Is there any? Uh, the, the only problem is that if you go from one place to another, which is only uh, a few hundred meters away, you can get a very different water. So then you you have a tewa which is associated to to a very narrow place mm. um, and even sometimes you have breweries that are taking water from two different wells and there are different waters mm. so uh, that's that's the limit but i think it doesn't fundamentally uh, play against what we're saying which is that um, water plays a very important role in the characteristic of the sake mm. and yeah. so it's, it's part of the terroir of sake i think a big problem is that a lot of these mountains straddle more than one or two prefectures so right. you've got a prefecture yeah. next door <laughs> claiming that they produce the same characteristics from the same water. Then, of course, you lose the idea of a tewa because, you know, the guy, that's, he can make the same sake. Where's your tewa gone? Where's your identity gone now? And there's not a problem with that. Why does the tewa have to be such a small area? Maybe it could be a bigger, you know, mm-hmm. maybe it can be more of a range we can, we can give to the tewa. You know, talking about water, I think it's, it is really difficult to, uh, to define terroir in terms of water because of that reason exactly. Um, mm-hmm. And for example, with the brewery I'm working at right now at uh, Chiyo no Kame Shuzo in Ehime Prefecture, mm-hmm. there's another brewery very close to us in the same exact town. And our water sources are different. Mm-hmm. And the final product is very different, despite the fact that, you know, obviously there's there's other factors that come into play, production techniques, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the yeast being used, things like that. Uh, we use... Um, we both use the same rice in certain brews, uh, but yet produce a very different final product. And um, I think for that exact reason, it would be hard or difficult to say that, okay, you know, all of sake from this prefecture, from Ehime prefecture, mm-hmm. tastes this way because they all use the same water. Even yeah. a prefecture is huge. And just within a town, you can get very different water characteristics. Right. What so, I'm saying is the terroir of your brewery and the terroir of the brewery next, next door is different. Door, yeah. uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I that's totally, because I totally agree. that maybe the house style is overruling. There's there's so many different... It's I don't think it's any one factor. I yeah, think it's. I think there's, there's again, the production comes into play, the type mm. of rice being used, the yeast, house style, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. One final point I'll make about maybe championing the water as the sake tewa. Your problem you have here is that you can use any water to make sake. Right. Or you, or you can filter, filter it. water. All you have to do is filter it. It doesn't and have to be spring water. There's a big problem with a lot of breweries losing their natural water sources because of infrastructure. Uh, I'll give mm-hmm. you an example here. Shizuoka Prefecture right now is having infrastructure because of the linear motor car. And there, there's a big kind of, you know, I think maybe they've come to a, an agreement, but... They, I think they're going to lose a certain area, which includes part of their natural water sources. And I know a lot of breweries don't use natural water sources. You know, they just use whatever, you know, they, some of them actually Some places transport don't think water. about it at all. No, yeah, there yeah. you go. Or yeah. what they'll do is, and I don't know if this is the same in the shochu world, but um, a lot of breweries will perform reverse osmosis on the water, right. which yeah. essentially yeah. strips the characteristics of that water. <laughs> right. It neutralizes now, it, yeah. Yeah, and it's not a bad thing. They do it 
because they want they, they want to remove any minerals that could potentially have a negative impact on the brewing. Um, but that certainly kind of can strip some of the characteristics um, that are, you know, perhaps unique to that that water or That's that region. Right. Um, and I'll, I know a lot of breweries uh, that do that within yeah. Japan. And that's, not a, again, not a bad thing. Should we move on maybe to yeast then? Yeast. <laughs> you want to start us off on <laughs> yeast? Totally. Sure. Um, so yeast, I think, uh, is another um, part of the equation that can be discussed, certainly. Um, and one of the reasons is because yeast, uh, you have yeast that are specific, at least within Japan, um, specific to certain prefectures, certainly specific to certain breweries as well. We all know about, you know, breweries that uh, pride themselves on using yeast that's only found, say, you know, within that brewery that's been growing there mm -hmm. for hundreds of years. Um, I can speak to um, at least, you know, Ehime Prefecture um, and some of the use, the yeast that we use at Chiyono Kame, we use a um, yeast called EK7, which is mm -hmm. developed by the prefecture and is not uh, it's very carefully guarded. It's not uh, sent out to any other prefectures. Um, and so in that in that sense, you could say that, you know, some of the flavor and aroma profiles that are uh, unique to that yeast um, are unique to that region. Um, you know, the nearby prefecture, Kochi Prefecture, there's a lot of breweries. They're doing the same thing um, using yeast that is specific only to that prefecture. And you've got Again, the, the, you know, these research institutes that are uh, part of the prefecture have government funding, what have you, and they have, um, you know, special institutes where they're developing and perfecting the yeast. Um, There's definitely something going on with regional identity creation here, isn't there? Absolutely. Nearly every prefecture in Japan now, you see some, whether it's new varieties of rice or new varieties of yeast or even koji, and we'll talk about that in a sec. It's, you know, you've got this trying to create a regional identity that sets them apart from the prefecture next door or you know and makes maybe makes sake easier to you know to find that sake that suits your particular taste preference if you understand what kind of style that prefecture is creating then it makes it easier to kind of you know um it will make sake more accessible there's no doubt about that it's fun for the consumer it's it certainly is. enjoyable for the consumer Absolutely. i would argue because you you ha have a chance to to try a sake that's only can yeah. only be produced in that region more or less Mm. I forgot to mention when we were talking about the rice, actually, a really, really important point is that sake brewers could not grow their own rice until very recently. There was a right. law in place after the, put in place after the war, 1942, I think it was, the Staple Food Act, which forbid brewers growing their own rice to protect the agriculture, the farmers. And it kind of, it's degraded over that time. It's kind of, they've loosened the rules until now where brewers can actually grow their own rice. Um, I think first they, they loosened the rules so that they could source their rice from a local farmer and they didn't have to buy it from the cooperative, which was the case before. And now they can grow their own rice. Before you can grow your own rice, I mean, you can't even have a discussion about tewa. So that, that's a big change. So I just throw in there. Where does the koji come into all this? We need to talk about the koji because mm. cause sake has to be made with koji. So where, where does the koji? And koji, of course, is a massive ingredient in shoju as well, right? You've got three different types. So probably more so in koji because you have these three different types or we are using the white koji in sake brewing now as well but wh where does the koji come into that i mean can can we say there's a maybe a towa with the koji i mean is that a stretch what do you think i know of a couple of small distilleries that i'm, I'm not at liberty to say which ones but they're experimenting with uh basically kura, kuratsuki koji mm -hmm. and they're just letting it naturally oh. go see what happens and there's some wild stuff going on oh, really? and it's and it's in these really tiny koji rooms that they've been using for generations and we could debate the level of cleanliness in a couple mm. of them but, <laughs> but that's probably part but, of it you yeah, know that's but what it creates that's a, a unique koji yeah. oh so it's amazing yeah. whether or not it's you know clean yeah. or sterile <laughs> yeah it really doesn't yeah, matter still, yeah Sometimes they have this thing, right, on the wood in the koji room that they, they paint over to try and, like, they varnish over something to try and stop it from affecting the, the flavor of the koji. But, yeah. Well, it, a, lot of, a lot of um, sake, uh, sake breweries are not using cedar uh, koji rooms. Mm -hmm. um, Chionokami is an, another example. And a, a lot of more modern breweries are, um, I would say, you know, kind of shying away from that because it's more difficult to clean um mm. so they're opting for you know whether it be stainless steel or different uh mm. materials um so that they can have a, a really clean room and and mm. you know clean it more easily it's it's difficult to clean cedar uh, 
maybe we have to explain to our listeners that uh, the reason why we're spending time talking about the koji room and mm. uh, the way koji is made is because the, the mold itself, the koji kin, um, is basically a limited mm. number of, of, of products. I mean, they, it's most always bought outside That's right. That's right. from a lab yeah. and, um, and brewers will use similar products from one side of the country to the other. Um, I'm mentioning that, and at the same time, I'm thinking of uh, people like Terada Honke, for example, yeah, I can think of a number. Who, who are um, uh, actually collecting yeah. some uh, mold from rice fields yeah. and uh, turn that into um, to, to make koji. Right. And um, Spoiler this... <laughs> alert, koji, I found this out recently, koji kin is found on the ears of the rice, yes. if you didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's where they get it. And um, uh, and so they they produce a particular sake based on that natural uh, koji kin that is that's right in the rice field next to the brewery. So in in Hyogo Prefecture, this shrine, which is the Niwata Shrine, they recently found some new koji strain there, and they've started making sake based on that. that oh, that's koji awesome! That found. Yeah, that's cool. you're going to see this increase definitely yeah. because no one wants to be limited by the same. Uh, strange. We really wanted to ask the koji maker, one of the koji makers, uh, we'll do in another episode, kind of what their take is on this. But, um, but it's, a, it's a great story. I mean, if you build, you. A, if you build yeah. the terroir sake, uh, yeah. you want to have your own koji cake. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Well. And your own yeast. Yeah. And your own water. But the, well, how could the koji, you think, how could the koji possibly influence the end style of the sake? And it all comes down to, well, if you have different levels of humidity, you're going to have different mold growth. And the more the mold grows, the more kind of enzymatic, uh, re- you know, you're actually, uh, enzymatic, uh, reaction activity. process mm-hmm. you're going to, activity you're going to have. And that will either give you a more kind of glucose rich sake or kind of less glucose rich. It has a massive impact on the, the end product. We've got to talk about people, surely. The people who make the sake, who brew the sake. I mean, we said how style is a massive, you know, has a massive impact on the end flavor, maybe more so than the raw ingredients. Um, People, I mean, they've always played a massive role in, I mean, a lot of breweries have this blurb, right? And they say the same kind of thing. They say, we'd like to impart the passion of the brewer into mm. our end product. Mm. You ever seen that, right? Mm. Yeah. And that says it all for me. So so when you say people, though, you're, yeah, you're talking let's focus about... focus a bit more. Yeah, yeah. so when you... Uh, how do you define people? You're defining yeah. it as essentially the the labor of love that goes into the creation of the product, or are you talking about the skill set of the people that are working, or is it all of that? So I we think have, it's a very we have the Toji system, right? And then so, there is also the Toji style. Yeah, yeah. We, right. we have to look at the Toji style because I mean, pretty much all the sake styles that exist today in most parts of Japan, I think, or most of, most of Japan, with a lot of exceptions, of course, um, most of the styles we're familiar with have been determined by a particular Toji. Guild, right? And we'll, or have been we'll influenced have to, to influence, a certain degree. We should perhaps say, yeah. Um, and of course, because the original system is that uh, you know, half a year, this this toji would go off and work at a particular brewery, and probably the brewery would probably hire the same toji, you know, numerous times. And the brewer, brewery them itself would take the hands off, you know, it would be a hands off approach, right? Traditionally, we wouldn't get involved with the sake brewing. So it's the toji that really defined the the end style in that particular brewery, in that particular prefecture, even. So you, you actually have particular Toji styles, right? You have the Nambu style, you have the Tamba style, the Izumi style, yeah, I- Izumi style, sorry. Um, you have the one, you have the Ishikawa style as well. So, I mean, what do you reckon? I mean, people, how much does the people, in, in the wine world as well, people is a big part of the Tawar, isn't it? Um, there are definitely some some styles yeah. um, across, uh, across regions. Um, yeah. But... I mean, here in, in Sake, it's so, so obvious to me um, that the local Toji, I mean, the Toji system and the, the facts that Toji were gathering uh, Korabito from a particular region, a particular village sometime, mm-hmm. um, teaching them one particular way of making Sake has a strong influence on the style of the Sake, there's absolutely no doubt. Mm-hmm. So people is kind of a tick, really, isn't it? Well, we, it's hard to kind of pick that up in the end product, right? Yeah. Right. I think it is. Now, what is it? Uh, Number Bijin says that their sake is very sunny because their their brewery brewers have a very sunny, you know, uh, disposition mm-hmm. to kind of impart that into the sake. I th- I think that's a huge part of the end product, though, mm. because uh, you know um, it is a common discussion. If if you have people making whether it be sake or any food product for that. Uh, 
matter that they hate their job they're you know having a terrible time making it and you know are just miserable the the entire time the final product is not going to taste very well and it's it's discussed in sake as well you know they they talk about you know differences in the the passion and uh sort of the like you said in with nambu bijin the uh internal say whether it be culture or just um how the people are uh you know, interacting and how, how they feel about their job and how that can influence the final product. So I think it's, I don't know if you can trace it back to terroir or not, but I think it's an important part of the production process, certainly. Yeah. And if you want to use the terroir as a marketing tool, and we'll talk about it at the end about, you know, the argument for terroir in the first place, but yeah, if you want to use it as a marketing tool, I mean, talking about the people is a very well, good, yeah, it's a oh, great absolutely. way to relate with mm-hmm. the consumer, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of consumers have their favorite brewer, don't they? You know, like, and they drink this because they like the brewer. They like sure. the personality of the brewer. They like the farmers great. too. If you introduce them to the farmers, if you tell that story, that's a very sexy, yeah, very, very attractive mm. uh, narrative for a lot of consumers. So. Mm. And I think this is going to probably increase and probably become stronger as we go forward, especially with this increase in um, owner toji, right? So the, the right. Actual brewery itself is actually the toji as well, and that's going to definitely lead to kind of stronger. Um, Terroirs, I think, in the future. Mm. Let's briefly, because I think at the same time, this plays a little bit against the Toji style story. Right. This individual brewer is not necessarily was necessarily True. trained in True. the style that True. used to be the style of mm. the region. They pick their own, really, don't they? Yeah, yeah it becomes own, more a personality most, thing, yeah, doesn't most, it? Most often, they develop their own personality. But surely that that gives you the, that gives you more of a potential to create a terroir because. Mm. If you have one Toji guild, and they're massive at the end of the day, you know, you have this massive area of Japan that's making sake in a particular style. Whereas if you, have, with the only Toji, you can have just this one brewery basically making sake in, in a particular style. And a much stronger argument for Tewar, I think. Oh, and you have uh, regions that don't have any Toji guilds. There's a True. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably a majority lot, of them now. Tokyo being right. one of them. <laughs> Tokyo, right? Well, I mean, yeah, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, those guilds are dying out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. may used to have a guild, it's, it's since disbanded, and so you have um, uh, Toji, or uh, not even people that are Toji necessarily. They're just the uh, the head brewers. They don't have the the Toji uh, yeah. certification, and um, they're not necessarily following any specific techniques that are unique to that region. What about the argument that the Toji system may have even restricted the Tewa up until now? If you have you know a pressure to actually use a particular style of uh, guild, Toji Guild in a particular area, you don't even have the freedom to even explore too well, right? And you don't have this in the wine world, right? You don't have anything like the Toji system in the wine world, do you? I'm not aware of anything like that. No, <laughs> I've never heard of anything like that. Um, um, but I think there are maybe loose similarities in that, for example, in one French appellation, you have to use certain types of grapes and then certain ratio of blending, mm-hmm. right? So it's sort of like a it does deviate from a people mm. um, element, but I think in saying that a loose, uh, you know, a vague general, um, vague geographic region must produce certain style of whether it be wine or sake. I think there are you can draw loose connection to what the Toji Guild mm. um, perhaps traditionally was trying to accomplish, mm. and I don't know if I could stretch it as far as to say it impeded the growth of terror mm. movement, but um. Um, I guess you could say that Toji would often um, share techniques or if you know um, they were experiencing, for example, a poor harvest year, they would try to gather and put their ideas collectively so that as a state or as a region, they can overcome adversities. So I think in that sense, it probably created a more cohesive or a more mm. collective flavor profile in um, a certain region. Versus We're not nature. trying to belittle the Toji system. We love <laughs> no. the Toji system. It, it, you know, we, we, we wish it could be around for much longer. We hope we can find ways mm-hmm. for it to be around much longer because it's an excellent system. And, you know, there's some amazing styles from it. Why do we even need to have this debate in the first place? I mean, why do we even need to have a Tuar in the second world? Mm-hmm. And why, why is this, you know, such a big buzz word right now in the industry? And I guess it's because there are a lot of smaller breweries where they're kind of the only way that they can really set themselves apart mm-hmm from the bigger breweries, at least in the eyes of the consumer, is kind of the, have a regional identity, right? And I think there, they have less pressure from the consumer. They can be a little bit more experimental. They can experiment a little bit with the idea of a tiroir. 
right? Big breweries that they suddenly change their entire style. Can you imagine that? I mean, it, it just logistically, that just wouldn't happen. Um, and maybe on a future podcast, we should definitely get the opinion of some bigger breweries. But um, generally, I don't think bigger breweries really go into this. This dip. there are examples. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> there are some there's small some, examples, there's some small right? Examples. We right. Kikumasamune, They did like a project um, where the, they made one special brand, and it was all about using local ingredients, locally sourced right. ingredients, things like that. And I think Hakai San as well um, are doing something as well, aren't they? But generally, this tends to be a craft brewery, a small brewery. Thing. And I guess in the shochu world, it would be the same, right? Yes, it's... More small distilleries. Um, so what do you think? Consumer demand, I mean... I think not all consumers are aware quite yet of, uh, of region, regionability or terroir, whatever you want to call true. it, how it, how it uh, plays out in sake. Mm. I think that uh, when, when you, your smaller breweries are using locally sourced ingredients as much as possible a lot of times, um, they're doing so for a lot of different reasons, you know, playing into the whole sustainability, um, uh, not fad, but, you know, sustainability is a good thing. They want to source locally as much as possible. Um, and then when they push that out and when they, they focus on that, I think there are a lot of consumers that, you know, whether they're sake fans or not, um, if they see on the bottle that this brewery is using 100% locally sourced ingredients um, or they're using rice that's specific to that region or whatever it is that's specific to that region, they then want to, they're, they're curious and they want to give it a try. Yeah. So um, I would say that the demand is, is, can be there, but it, whether it's there or not, it certainly uh, can pique the consumer's interest. And demand may be driving the current demand for the terroir, like you just used the S word and the sustainability word, that could be a big driving force for the current kind of boom in terroir in the second world because, yeah, I think that's a that's a big thing in any agricultural industry, but in particular, the sake industry. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that could definitely, going forward as well, that could definitely drive this. Sebastian? I mean, we, we've, we've discussed at length uh, how terroir for sake, in the sense that, in the meaning of the word, the origin of sake, um, goes far beyond the ingredients that make sake because it includes techniques and other things. Um, however, I, 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 I do believe that in, in um, most people's mind, terroir as a word remains associated with the ingredients, the main ingredients, the raw material. Yeah. And um, this movement toward uh, highlighting a, a terroir or using the terroir word uh, in association with a sake goes hand in hand with uh, the the fact that more and more brewers are getting control of their rice supply yeah definitely uh, you mentioned it uh, throughout the yeah. throughout the you mentioned it throughout the, the, the podcast but yeah. and in other podcasts as well but all of this is clearly um, connected so mm. if uh, rather than buying your rice from a cooperative if you're uh, contracting it or better if you're making it mm. you want to you want to say it mm. um and that's why you want to use the, the terroir word or something similar to it definitely it's when you've actually got your own kind of identity and you've got your own brand that you need a marketing tool right and that's where the kind of the terroir thing comes in but maybe they don't need to use the word terroir in the sake industry maybe we can find another word maybe we can find a unique better interpretation of of it Japanese word. Have to, yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? A Japanese yeah. word. Which I mean, exactly might work, but I mean, it already has the connotations attached to it. We always have a debate in, in, in French that you don't have in English about how do you call a, a sake brewery a, a kura. Oh, because I heard this from Sylvain. You, 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 yeah, you, yeah. you call it a brewery, right. and I don't know where it's coming from. You call it a brasserie. But, but in France, <laughs> yeah. a brasserie yeah. uh, brings something with it that some people, including Sylvain, uh, yeah. Don't like, and I don't use brasserie as I a think word. of a restaurant when you say I brasserie. Use, I use maison, which comes from the wine ah. world, yeah. but it's, it's not perfect. It's you use it in the perfect. fashion world as well, don't you? Maison yeah, for the fashion world. Well. So, yeah, I have I mean, the same problem. I, I like our language <laughs> to adopt kura as, as, a, uh, as, a, as a word. And then comes an important uh, question is, is it le kura ou la kura? Masculine or feminine. My point here, my main point was, um, Maybe we should try to find, and I don't know if it exists in Japanese today, but mm. a Japanese word to express 
to express that. Mm. Mm. Maybe we should give some honorable mentions because there's no way we're going to get through every single element of today's podcast. We give some honorable mentions. We could have talked about climate, but I think in reality, Japan has a, a wide variety of different climates. And probably we should do an entire podcast on microbes. Right. Yep. I mean, in cheese making, <laughs> lactic acid is the thing that gives you the tewa, right? So it's kind of what the, the grass that the cows are eating and then the lactic bacteria inside them. That's what actually gives you this, these unique flavors, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, actually that those are the honorable mentions. I don't think there was anything we missed. We did actually get through quite a lot of the elements. Let's just kind of finish up by talking about the very briefly kind of. Like we're saying, you know, so what are the merits you think of having a tua in the sake world? It's a great story. Mm. Story. Mm. Yeah. And I think from an international marketing perspective, you, you really need that story. You really need to be able to talk about the place. Mm. Right. If you really want people to care about your product, mm. and then the you philosophy can't, that yeah. goes into it. Exactly. And you can't, you can't be at, you know, Vin Expo coming up, you know, in France in France and say, and people ask you, oh, okay, where's your ma- rice made? And you go, well, I'm not really sure. <laughs> that just doesn't compute. And you know? breweries really struggle with this, right? When they're trying to sell the sake overseas, they don't have, they can't really give the kind of a spiel that will allow the consumer to identify with their product. They do need that story. And mm. I think, that, and probably that's why a lot of breweries do end up using the word tewa because instantly it kind of, you know, people overseas, they connect to that and, oh yeah, okay, you have a tewa, that's, oh, I get it. Okay, that's, that's cool. Um, but the story is definitely key. What else, uh, Marie? Any other? Um, I think the embracing the idea of tower kind of gives breweries a bit more creative latitude, if you will. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so perhaps it's like a micro. What's a good way to put it? So if the Toji style was a bit more macro and a bit more regional. Um, spanning over several different prefectures in certain cases. Um, speaking of terror gives each brewery and each more micro regions more control of expressing themselves more freely and more explicitly, perhaps. Um, we talked about like each brewery, for example, to Eli's point earlier on, each brewery having their own terror, even if they're from the, located in the same city. So I think embracing this movement toward terror or more acknowledgement of terror gives each brewery a chance to if they should they want to um, explore different styles, different expressions that is only unique to them, and um, coming back to the story bit, yeah, that would be amazing, wouldn't that? That would be really cool. And what what about in your brewery's case, Eli? Like, do you, is this part of the brewery's mission? It's a huge part of our mission. Oh, wow. um, do so you use the word tewa? We yeah. do not. We don't. Um, but uh, so Chiyo no Kame sources they, they pride themselves themselves on. Uh, sourcing locally grown organic rice um, and they uh, like to highlight that um, in the ingredients section on the label certainly um, another way they do it is uh, also again you know we were talking about the yeast through highlighting that they use a yeast that is um, at this case in point uh, specific um, to ehime prefecture um, so uh, our br- and we also talk about water as well and how we source water that's from um you know, very, very close to our brewery. There's a beautiful river running nearby and, and all of that. So um, for our brewery, while we don't use that uh, that particular word, um, it's a, a huge part of the story and a part of our um, marketing uh, materials and, and um, yeah, how we promote uh, this and sell the sake. I guess my point, my merit would be a single origin. And it's often called, often can be also called a single origin. Right now, especially in the sake industry right now, where you still have a lot of breweries that use rice from other prefectures or, you know, that I think that confuses the consumer. And I think it's easier when you've got a single origin and all the ingredients come from one place. Mm-hmm. And also then it allows you con- to connect more to mm-hmm. the place. Then it gets you interested, you know, and in Japan, you have a lot of rural areas which are struggling with, you know, reduced populations or whatever. You've got the big population aging pro- uh, population problem in Japan. I, that's one way of maybe a solution to that problem, making people more interested in that particular region, right? When you've got to, when you're talking about the sake, when you've got to talk about Yamana Nishiki from Hyogo Prefecture, it moves you away from that mm. region. It's no longer just about that region. I, I find sake with single origins so much more identifiable, so much easier to connect with than sake where the rice is being put from here, there and everywhere. And maybe psychologically, if anything, you can pick that up on the palate. I, I enjoy drinking sake that's, you know, that uses ingredients that are 
uh, unique to that region. It's, yeah. it's uh, for me personally, it's just a little more uh, fun and interesting to do because because right. I usually do find differences in in the flavor profile. So, and I would say um, to your point about uh, you know the demand of of um, rice and how that is you know could be tied back to supporting that local economy if we have a brewery that's using all local ingredients and the demand for that sake increases then that means the demand for that rice increases you know and so the brewery is able to support the local farmers it's it's a you know a harmonious um you know kind of marriage or exchange of Mm -hmm. of, um you know skill sets and and exchange of services and things so i think um I think it's great to to source those local ingredients as much as possible if it um, supports the type of sake that you're trying to create as a Definitely. brewer. Um, and uh, I hope that we see more of it. Let's not forget the original told you was a rice farm. Yeah. I still, I, it's interesting because I think breweries still have a choice. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them make the choice of becoming I'll call them terroir breweries in the sense of a better word. And that's because <laughs> the word of the day. But uh, producing sake with a local style only that they define, mm-hmm. arguably, I mean, local rice only and so on and so forth, as what you do uh, down there in Hine. Uh, but others still have the choice to have a production from rice source from other parts of the country. And on part of the production only, release a market that has a strong uh, single origin uh, image to mm. use that uh, word which I actually like mm. um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a flexibility uh, which uh, is a great tool to, um, to play with and slowly maybe drive uh, the brewery and the brand towards something different and that's got to help with the survival of these smaller breweries as well. And let's not forget that the industry is still is not you know out of the the, the dark ages as far as you know. Uh, it's not really growing in the way we might want it to. So this could help a lot of smaller breweries to kind of grow. And do you have the same? Is that the same? The shoji? Just before well? before you yeah. before you enter that question, Chris, yeah. uh, because what I, what I meant as well is not only a tr- it's a choice in terms of marketing, but it, it corresponds to reality, changing the rice you're working with, mm. changing the water or, or the elements you're working with is, is a risk. No, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to, uh, to, if you want to keep the quality level, um, you, you, you need, you, well, you, you will be sweating yeah. uh, to see the results. Um, so it's, it's got to be a, a, a controlled, challenge. a controlled, slow process. You yeah. cannot just switch. Like that. And right. challenging is a new thing in the industry as well, isn't it? Right? Traditionally, <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'm not in a bad way, but just, you know, it was easier just to kind of make your sake from rice, being sourced from the crop, whatever you got, mm-hmm. get your hands on. And it, it was, you didn't really want to take that risk. You didn't really want to, you didn't have to. Right? And also, yeah. there's a reason why Yamada Nishiki, for example, is called the king of sake rice, right? I mm. mean, not only does it yield good sake, but also it's easy to handle. And that's a primary lower benefit, risk. lower risk yeah. rice. Um, yeah effectively so that's a, a, you know an absolute benefit if you are a producer and Definitely. you don't to sebastian's point you don't want to risk that by trying a perhaps a newer strain of a local rice that mm. you're less familiar with with the rice composition you know how it's going to behave its minerality so on and so forth so um, and coming at all or something right you start using coming at all that's a real challenge isn't it for brewers because they don't know how it just doesn't behave itself it just does what it wants to do you have mm. no idea how it's going to do in the brewery and using so, locally sourced ingredients especially rice isn't always the cheaper option i no. just like to highlight no. that as well mm. so yeah. a lot of the breweries that are using locally sourced rice that, that pride themselves on that they're taking a risk like you said uh in terms of how the rice can react and how mm. the final product comes out but they're taking a risk financially as well because they're essentially saying that we care enough to spend a few mm. extra bucks or not just a few quite a lot sometimes mm. um and we think that that's important we think it's important to support our local mm. uh you know economy and local farmers and that um, at the end of the day, the consumer cares about that as well. And they think that it uh, creates a product that, that the consumer, it'll resonate with the consumers. Mm. So you can't just switch. It's very risky. You, you can't just decide suddenly overnight to start growing your own local rice either. It takes five years, right, to convert these fields into, to actually be suitable for growing sake rice. Even if you have a sake rice field to begin with, 
you still got to change the soil composition or whatever, you know, and it takes, I, I heard it takes like five years or maybe it takes a bit less in some cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question, sorry, Chris. So in the shochu world, um, do you have the same kind of, you know, things that help smaller distilleries to kind of survive, you know, is the shochu world healthy? I would, well, no, I would say that they've plateaued and they're very much, they're losing like a percentage point every year. But the, the way that I would look at it is that the smallest distilleries are fine. They, they, they make what they make. They've got ardent fans. They can sell their product every year. That's not a big concern for the, for them. The big distilleries, the massive, the big boys, they're fine too, hmm. because they have the resources. They have the economies of scale to maintain their margins. They'll, they'll create new markets if they need to. It's the, it's the middle folks who are in big trouble in the shochu world. Uh, they are, trying to make it to the next step but they don't have the same economies of scale they don't have the same uh raw human power and the 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 human hours to be able to devote to all these different things and yeah money's a huge thing as well so absolutely these mid-range places need this need this type of thinking they need to figure it out on their own and just like in the sake world you know if they can figure it out everything gets better for everyone um, but demographic time bomb for everybody. And yeah. uh, so yeah. we need, we, I mean, the writing's on the wall. It has been there forever. We need foreign markets and nobody knows how to do that. So it's a, it's a pretty wild, mm. they're just throwing, throwing pasta at the wall right now. So. Well, you know, we didn't claim at the beginning of this podcast that we were going to be able to conquer this topic in one go, right? It, impossible. There's still so much exploration of the two are going on. There isn't a definite answer to the question, should sake have a tiwar and what, what is it? You know, how will it, how will it be shaped in the future? And that's why there will definitely be more podcasts on this topic. So you can, uh, you can look forward to that. We'll, we'll try and dive deeper into some of these elements in future podcasts and get some actual insight as well, direct from the breweries. Um, and, uh, then we can give more of a kind of informed view on that. So thank you much, very much, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. It's been a for pleasure. Me. It's a pleasure being here. And as always, this uh, podcast is possible uh, with the support from the uh, Sake and Shochu Makers Association here in Japan. And we, um, we occupy their lovely information center to do this recording. And with that, we will we'll see you in another episode of, uh, or you'll hear us another episode of Sake on Air. And we can be found on all the social media, uh, platforms with the hashtag, uh, with that, sorry, the handle at Sake on Air, and um, everyone's kind of um, Instagram handles and everything. We'll put those in the on the website. Yeah, yeah. is that okay? Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining me on this uh, topic. It's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, we will see you next time on the second. Kanpai. <laughs>